Hello, I'm Trevor Van Schooneveld. I'm an Associate Professor of Infectious Disease at the University of Nebraska Medical Center, and I'm the Medical Director for our Antibiotic Stewardship Program. I have an interesting case to talk about where we use procalcitonin, but before we talk about that, I do want to just briefly review the kinetics of procalcitonin. Procalcitonin is a biomarker of bacterial infection, and it rises rapidly, typically within three to six hours of, an, of a systemic bacterial infection, such as sepsis or lower tract infection. What happens to procalcitonin really depends on what you do as a clinician and how you manage the infection. Typically, procalcitonin levels are going to peak at about 12 to 24 hours after the infection begins. And, you know, if you've not treated the infection or perhaps haven't gotten them started on the right antibiotics, uh, the procalcitonin levels tend to go up and stay up or continue to rise. But if you get the patient on the right antibiotics, you begin treating the infection appropriately, that procalcitonin level should generally decline about 50% per day. Now that's a rough estimate. It may be a little faster, maybe a little lower, depending on the patient, but about every 24 hours, it's going to decline by about 50% as long as you've treated the infection appropriately. Another important thing to understand about procalcitonin is what does the level mean? Procalcitonin levels aren't as simple as positive or negative. What the number is really carries uh, uh, import. Uh, when procalcitonin levels are very low, less than 0.1, that generally means an infection due to bacteria is very unlikely. And the literature would suggest it's safe to withhold antibiotics in most cases. When the procalcitonin levels are between 0.1 and 0.25, generally, again, very unlikely that there's a bacterial infection and you don't really need antibiotics. Once they go above 0.25 in lower tract infection, that's an area where we should think about starting antibiotics. And particularly as they go higher than that, and the higher they are, the more likely there is a bacterial infection. The um, recommendation would be that you start antibiotics in those patients. Now, in any patient who's super sick or where I'm just 100% confident they have a bacterial infection, well, then you may want to start antibiotics anyway. Uh, and particularly if they're super sick, you may start and then withdraw if the procalcitonin levels stay low. But these are the general guidance that we use uh, for patients with lower stretch tract infections. And so with that as a background, I want to talk about a case that uh, we saw at our institution. We had a 65-year-old female who'd recently uh, been in our facility who came in from a long-term care facility where she'd been doing rehab. She developed increasing shortness of breath over the last 24 to 36 hours and just have some cough, but it was not really productive of much. She's a little cyanotic, cyanotic on exam. Her O2 saturations were running in the 80% range, uh, and she didn't have any fevers or chills. Uh, she did have a significant medical history, though, and she'd recently been hospitalized at our facility uh, for an acute MI where she'd undergone uh, stenting of her coronary arteries. On evaluation in our emergency department, her labs, her white count was moderately elevated, about 12 and a half with a little bit of a left shift, 87% neutrophils. Her lactate was mildly elevated at 2.9. And her chest x-ray demonstrated some infiltrates. Uh, they were a bit asymmetric and could be consistent with heart failure or could be consistent with pneumonia. As with many of our chest x-rays, it's hard to tell the difference. And so the differential when the patient was evaluated is this community-acquired pneumonia or maybe hospital-acquired pneumonia with early sepsis and an elevated lactate, um, or is this heart failure due to atrial fibrillation, which she was also noted to have. Now, the procalcitonin was measured when she came to the ED, and it was 0 0.05. So basically, at the very bottom end of the spectrum. In the ED, she was given antibiotics, but when our hospitalist team evaluated her, they looked at the whole picture and said, boy, boy, it doesn't look like heart, doesn't look like pneumonia to us. And so they managed her with rate control for atrial fibrillation and diuretics. And by the next morning, she was off oxygen and significantly better. And that was without giving her any antibiotics. And so I think this case illustrates nicely uh, one of the problems that we have, which is that patients come in and it can be kind of hard to sort out. Do they have pneumonia? Am I worried about sepsis? Or is this heart failure? And really we're seeing like hypoperfusion of the kidneys instead of um, 
uh, instead of sepsis. We're seeing hyperperfusion due to heart failure. And, and so it's hard to sort those things out. And so I think this also illustrates that procalcitonin can help us to safely withhold antibiotics. And that's what the literature suggests is that in patients where you're concerned about lower surgery tract infection, a very low procalcitonin value is supportive that it's safe to withhold antibiotics and monitor the patient clinically. And I think other literature would suggest that giving antibiotics to patients with heart failure is actually detrimental to their care. And so procalcitonin can also help us to do things that aren't useful. So I think this case illustrates uh, two uses of procalcitonin. One, to help us to provide the right care with diuretics, rate control for atrial fibrillation, but also it's to help us to avoid unnecessary care that could be harmful, like antibiotics, which carry a significant salt load and would have been less than ideal in this patient with heart failure. Thank you very much.